Being a community is thinking small. Our ultimate goals and purpose cannot simply be about ourselves. Unitarian Universalists, like members of every other religion, are trying to change the world by encouraging people to live a different way. By word and by deed, Unitarian Universalists are trying to change people. It's time for us to acknowledge and proclaim this and to see that building a religious community is but a means to a larger end. Yes, we do think that liberal religion offers a better way to live. We think that openness and hospitality are better ways to live than shouting, get off my lawn. We think that humility is a better way to live than my way or the highway. We think that gratitude and generosity are better ways to live than I got mine and you're on your own. We think that compassion is a better way to live than here's a quarter, go call somebody who cares. We think that honesty and living in truth are better ways to live than propaganda and denial and comforting stories. We think that self-possession is a better way to live than following the crowd or habit or unconscious compulsion. We think that awe and reverence are better responses to the world than, eh. Liberal religion has a purpose, and it is bigger than we think, and certainly bigger than gathering with like-minded people for mutual support. At this time, we'll have the lighting of the candles of community. You can light a candle for a joy or a concern or simply to bring more light into our space. stand and body or spirit for the lighting of the chalice and our spoken affirmation. Out of the flames of fear, we rise with courage of our deepest convictions to stand for justice, inclusion, and peace. Out of the flames of scrutiny, we rise to proclaim our faith with hope to heal a fractured and hurting world. Out of the flames of doubt, we rise to embrace the mystery, wonder, and awe of all there is and all that is yet to be. Out of the flames of hate, we rise with the force of love, love that celebrates our shared humanity. Out of the flames, we rise. Let us join together in our spoken affirmation. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth and freedom, and to help one another. Our opening thought comes from Brene Brown in her book, Daring Greatly. Vulnerability is the birthplace of love, belonging, joy, courage, 
empathy, and creativity. It is the source of hope, empathy, accountability, and authenticity. If we want greater clarity in our purpose or deeper and more meaningful spiritual lives, vulnerability is the path. Our next reading is from Brenda Alvarez from her essay, Get Uncomfortable Talking About Race, Inequality, and Injustice. And she's quoting Maxine Mosley, a school counselor from New Hampshire. Part of this learning is to lean into uncomfortableness and learn to be okay with that and to do something with it because you don't build social justice warriors from just saying, we have a problem. Our meditation this morning comes to us from Thich Nhat Hanh, from his work, Being Peace. And this is a poem titled, Recommendation. It's a poem that Thich Nhat Hanh wrote for the persons within his community who had been killed, and some also who had been tortured in their work to bring uh, love to the community around them and not take sides during the Vietnam War, but simply to be present and helpful to the community that was in that war-torn experience. The title of this poem is Recommendation. Promise me, promise me this day, promise me now. While the sun is over her, overhead, exactly at the zenith, promise me. Even as they strike you down with a mountain of hatred and violence, 
even as they step on you and crush you like a worm. Remember, remember, humanity is not our enemy. The only thing worthy of you is compassion. Invincible, limitless, unconditional. Hatred will never let you face the beast in humanity. One day, when you face this beast alone, with your courage intact, your eyes kind, untroubled, even as no one sees them, out of your smile will bloom a flower, and those who love you will behold you across 10,000 worlds of birth and dying. Alone again, I will go on with bent head, knowing that love has become eternal on the long, rough road. The sun and the moon will continue to shine. be dark with stars and burdens weigh my heart though troubles wait at every turn I know I can go on when sorrow heals my soul and burdens make me strong the troubles away
Our next reading is by Emmanuel Acho from his book, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. He writes, racism is not a virus of the body. It is a virus of the mind. And unfortunately, it can be lethal. But you cannot fix a problem that you do not know you have. And if ignorance, ignorance is bliss, in this case, bliss has caused bondage and pain for others. But there is a fix. We can all access the life-saving medicine that will cure the world's most ailing, long-lasting pandemic. But in order to access it, we're going to have to have some uncomfortable conversations. There are numerous authors in the self-help and leadership development genres who make the case that meaningful personal growth is not possible unless we allow ourselves to get out of our comfort zones. Now, I have to admit that I'm generally not a big fan of self-help and leadership development books as I tend to find them to be overly focused on self-improvement for self-advancement. But I do think that it is true that it is necessary for us to feel a bit uncomfortable before we are able to change our minds about things, before we are able to accept new and hopefully better ways of being in the world. It's rather easy to get overly comfortable in our worldviews. And sometimes we want to avoid changes that would wrest us away from our comfort zones. Our ideas and our beliefs are often deeply ingrained. They're deeply ingrained through our environment and through the influence, influence of persons who are important to us. 
And when we're confronted with the possibility that our beliefs and ideas might need to be transformed in some way, it's often difficult for us to accept. We are creatures of habit, and change is not something we easily embrace, especially if the change is related to long-held and deeply held convictions and values. Sometimes it takes getting out of our comfort zones or being made to feel uncomfortable about the way we see and experience the world before we are able to make changes, before we are able to grow as persons in the world. I see this looking back on my own life, and perhaps you see this looking back on your lives as well. When I was a teenager, my comfort zone was a fairly fundamentalist form of evangelical Christianity. I don't look back at this experience as being an entirely negative one for me. <clears throat> the evangelical Christian community of which I was a part gave me a sense of acceptance and belonging that I was not finding elsewhere at the time. But over time, I began to see this sense of belonging, this sense of feeling included, was all too often coupled with uh, an exclusion of others, an emphasis on who did not belong. Now, just to let you know how deeply I was a part of this rather fundamentalist evangelical Christianity, I was very close, up until the end of my junior year, I was very close to attending Oral Roberts University for college. If it had not been for a curfew and a dress code, I might have gone <laughs> in that direction. But instead, I ended up going to Oklahoma City University <clears throat> where I studied religion and philosophy. So quite a different path than going down the path of ORU. But even when I was at OCU, I was still a part of this evangelical Christian community. And in that community, I began to see that non-Christians were excluded, persons of different worldviews were excluded, persons of different sexual orientations and gender identities were excluded, and even scientific thought, rational scientific thought was excluded. I began to see that my community was defined as much by whom and what it excluded than it was by almost any other factor. And through experience and relationships, I began to realize that I wanted to be a part of a community that drew the circle of community much wider than what I had been experiencing. My relationships and experiences in college and seminary and graduate school and beyond began to make me feel more and more uncomfortable about the, the people that my evangelical Christian community was excluding. My close friendship during college with a person who is Muslim helped me see that I wanted to draw the circle of my community wider to include persons who orient themselves to religion differently. My many friendships with persons who are LGBTQ2S plus have made me want to draw the circle of my community wider to include persons with different sexual orientations and gender identities. As I noticed that the evangelical Christian community of which I was a part was primarily white and American, I began to want to draw the circle of community wider to be more global and racially diverse. And my experience of studying and living in a number of different countries, including India and Switzerland and England, uh, and also in Germany, but in communities that were very diverse, very global, enhanced my longing for greater diversity in community. And as I became more and more aware that my community, the evangelical Christian community of which I was a part, was not recognizing the inherent worth and intrinsic value of non-human life, I felt compelled to draw the circle of my community even wider to include all of life on earth. Such changes in my understanding of community did not happen easily or quickly. If my parents were here, they could tell you that. <laughs> they were quite concerned about my being drawn to fundamentalist 
evangelical Christianity. They had a number of conversations with me about it. Uh, we had very deep disagreements about many things, especially during my teen years. Perhaps that's just a part of being a teenager. But it wasn't easy. It didn't happen quickly. Change is rarely easy. I had to feel uncomfortable with my previous views of who and what should be included in community before I experienced transformation in my worldview, my beliefs, and my practices. It took the patience and understanding of family and friends who helped me feel uncomfortable without rejecting my personhood. It also took learning to say the two things that the wise man Arthur Fonzarelli once had difficulty saying, I'm sorry and I was wrong. I can't use the Fonz too often in class at Oklahoma City University. Happy days is just not something that the college age students remember unless they're watching it on Nickelodeon or something like, <laughs> something like that. I'm sorry, and remember, as, as author Fonz really would say it, I was r -r 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 wrong. <laughs> I'm extremely thankful for both the persons and for the experiences that challenged me to get out of my comfort zone to embrace a more inclusive vision and experience of community. I most certainly would not be with you in this setting here today if it were not for these patient persons and life-changing experiences. But getting out of our comfort zones is not only about creating more inclusive community, as important as that is. It is not only about who is included in our community, it is also about what we in our communities are to do together to transform the world around us for the better and for the sake of justice. Even when we draw the circle of community wider, we can still become complacent in our new comfort zone and not engage in the action that is urgently needed in our world. Even in our more inclusive communities, our comfort zones can create and perpetuate injustice zones for other persons. We never fully arrive at just and beloved community for all. It is a perpetual process that never comes to full completion, but without which, we, without which love, courage, and justice can easily give way to hate, fear, and injustice. The tension between enjoying the flourishing of human communities without allowing them to perpetuate injustice for others is a tension that justice-seeking people simply must live with even if this tension makes us uncomfortable. Anytime our comfort zones create and perpetuate injustice zones for others, this is a time to be uncomfortable. This is a time to find ways to get out of our comfort zones to answer the call of justice. If our comfort zone in relation to the economic status quo perpetuates injustice for others and does not respect the rights well-being, worth, and dignity of workers, we must be uncomfortable and answer the call of economic justice. If our comfort with the social structures and laws of our society perpetuate injustice for women, for indigenous persons, for persons of color, for persons of different religions and no religion, for persons who are LGBTQ2S+, and for immigrants or for refugees, then we need to get out of our comfort zones and answer the call for social justice. When our comfort with our current practices in relation to the environment supports systems that bring harm to the most vulnerable and perpetuate environmental injustice and environmental racism, which we do experience in our society, then we must get out of our comfort zones and answer the call for environmental justice. When our comfort with our diets and our agricultural systems perpetuates injustice for animals and ignores their welfare and the well-being and integrity of our ecosystems, then we must get out of our comfort zone and answer the call for justice for ecological community. When our comfort with our systems of energy production and consumption perpetuates the injustice of an unlivable climate 
for the future, then we must get out of our comfort zones and answer the call for climate justice. Love and justice call all of us to do all that we can to make sure that our comfort is not built on the injustice of others. In one of his newspaper columns, you may have heard of Finley Peter Dunn. He was a journalist and he wrote newspaper columns. And one of his newspaper columns through a fictional character named Mr. Dooley, Peter Finley Dunn said, the job of the newspaper is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. If you've ever read the Oklahoma Observer, you'll know that that's their motto, right? Comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Perhaps this is also the role for a just and beloved community. To afflict ourselves with the call of justice when we get too comfortable with the systems that perpetuate injustice. And to find ways of working our way out of our comfort zones together in the pursuit of justice for all. May we never get so comfortable that we no longer hear and heed the call for justice. At this time, those who wish may bring their gifts to the table, and there's also opportunities for giving online.
I was given the very kind warning not to stand up before the credits. <laughs> Thank you for that. Let us stand and body our spirit for our parting thought and for the extinguishing of the chalice. Our parting thought comes from Angela, Angela Burkfield from her essay, Parenting is Uncomfortable, So is Social Justice. She writes, Let's sit with our discomfort together and support each other in it. Let's ask for help and offer help when we see that it is needed. Let's let ourselves drop the masks of perfection and happiness so we can get to the dirt, which is where the truth lives. Let us join together in the words to extinguish the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again.